This weekend, we welcome Jim Bovard, author and self-described muckraker. Jim is a well-known and prolific libertarian writer, appearing in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Reader's Digest, and many other publications. He's also the author of 10 books, including Attention Deficit Democracy, Terrorism and Tyranny, and the apparently semi-autobiographical Public Policy Hooligan. Jim and I discuss his incendiary career as a journalist, the American people as Mencken's bourgeoisie, and why the nanny state has him stocking up on cigars. Stay tuned. Welcome to Mises Weekends. I'm Jeff Dice. We're very pleased and very happy this weekend to be joined by none other than the great Jim Bovard. Jim, how are you this weekend? Doing fine. Thanks for having me on your program, Jeff. Well, no, no. Thank you for the time. I'd like to open, if you'll allow me, with just sort of a little bit of an anecdote. So when I was first working for Ron Paul, this would have been the early 2000s, you know, all of us in Ron's office, myself, Daniel McAdams, Norm Singleton, we had this view of you, you know, that you were sort of this incendiary bomb thrower. You came in and you'd write these articles for, let's say, Wall Street Journal, and they'd be these scorched earth articles. And and we never really had a good feel for you. Uh, we, we had some sense that you didn't live in the Beltway, that you sort of lived out in the mountains of West Virginia or Virginia. We were never quite sure. And and here you were always, you know, skewering the executive state in, in a way that made Ron very happy. But but we never I don't think we ever actually saw you. You were sort of like a unicorn or something. So does that does that uh, does that sound like your experience, or am I wildly inaccurate? Uh, you know, uh, it's uh, th- uh, that's a great vignette. You know, I mean, folks have certainly got the impression that I'm, um, you know, uh, way out there in the mountains. I was I was raised um, in the Shenandoah Valley in the mountainside there, so I uh, haven't lived there in a long time. But I mean, maybe there are certain attitudes. I mean, it's the old saying that it's possible to take the boy out of the mountains, you can't take the mountains out of the boy. Um, but I think I did run into some of your folks. I think I ran to Norm every now and then, uh, even back then. So, I mean, um, I guess I didn't spend that much time at Washington events because most of them seemed kind of odious. So when you bring up being raised in the mountains, was, was there anything about that experience, your family, your parents, your hometown, uh, that, that you think might have turned you into a natural or reflexive libertarian? Uh, sure. I mean, I was, I was raised in the South, a uh, South at a time when the South was getting hammered heavily by the federal government for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I was raised uh, outside the town where Stonewall Jackson won one of his biggest victories during the 1862 Valley Campaign. And I was also raised in an area that was the General Sheridan, the Northern General Sheridan, in 1864, burnt to the ground when he's basically trying to starve the South into submission towards the end of the war. And uh, it's I, I was always puzzled why there would be such a uh, why it would be so easy to portray Lincoln as this great moral hero and liberator when, if you looked at what the orders that he approved for what his generals actually did, there was so much, they, it was targeting civilians, it was killing, I'm sure, tens of thousands of folks uh, were severely harmed, if not killed by those orders, causing starvation, going in there and burning down the crops and the barns uh, and the mills just at a time of harvest. Um, in Georgia and, and Arkansas and Virginia towards the end of the war. Uh, so um, I was uh, another factor was I was coming of age in the 1970s and I, I was very interested in coin collecting. And that was uh, about the time that uh, President Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard and also imposed wage and price controls. And I was starting to follow some of the political commentary back then. And some of the folks I was reading uh, did a very nice job of explaining how how Nixon was so devious in what he had done and how it was an absolute breach of faith with the American people and and how Nixon was exploiting those wage and price controls to try to boost his own reelection chances. Uh, and at the same time, the Vietnam War was sputtering to a um, um, ignoble close. Uh, Nixon was starting to get caught up in Watergate. And it was easy to reach the conclusion that, that, that politicians were a criminal class and that the less power they had over uh, Americans, the better off this country would be. Well, Jim, it's interesting. In, in reading an old interview with you, uh, you, you mentioned the influence of Hayek's Road to Serfdom on your early development. And most journalists tend to view economics with at least disinterest, if not disdain. Uh, or even contempt, but it seems like at a pretty early stage in your intellectual development and your career, 
you were already thinking about uh, money and economics. Yeah, well, I was um, during my high school times. I enjoyed wheeling and dealing with coins, and later with gold and silver. And I had some very lucky timing getting into the silver market just before Nixon got impeached, or uh, just before Nixon was forced to resign. Uh, so uh, some of those early experiences, and and plus it was striking to me. I was interested in journalism, and I was I was puzzled that most journalists seem to have little or no curiosity as far as uh, Econ 101. Uh, when I started writing about farm programs in the 1980s, um, simply looking at how the price supports worked and how the government would set these prices uh, higher than market clearing prices, there would be a surplus, and then the politicians would say that the surplus proved the government needed more power. Well, anybody who knows anything about markets knows that that's complete BS, and yet the uh, Washington Post and a lot of other places w- w- would simply fall for one bogus government crisis after another. And um, you know, people can see the same thing now with foreign policy as far as the government creating bogus prices, uh, uh, bogus crises and using that to seize more power. But to take a step back, Hayek had a huge influence on me. Hayek, I, I was interested. I was gung-ho on free markets before I read Hayek. But then uh, reading uh, The Road to Serfdom uh, gave me a much better intellectual and philosophical framework to understand both how markets work and how how politicians and governments tend to go downward. Would you say that that a particular strain of of Austrianism or free market economics is is what turned you into a writer or was it just sort of part of the development? Uh, No, I, I, I was interested in becoming a writer before that, uh, shortly after I turned 18, I decided I wanted to be a writer, uh, and um, I was kind of pig-headed and confident and kept at it for a number of years when the articles did not sell. Eventually, the articles kept selling, so I kept writing. Uh, but it, it, I was I was a lot more interested in philosophy than I was in journalism or in economics, but uh, trying to sell articles in philosophy was really difficult. So I said, okay, well, let's, you know, let's figure out what sells. So... Moving forward, flash forward a few years, uh, I have a copy of your book, Attention Deficit Democracy, uh-huh. which you were kind enough to sign for me. Apparently it came out in 06. So one of the central themes in this book is sort of you've got these these evil federal agencies that are getting away with, in some cases, literally murder. Uh, but you also have the, the twin evils that make it possible. One is a sort what you describe as a docile media. And the second is this sort of overly credulous uninterested American public. And it, to me, anyway, it sort of harkens to uh, Mencken's concept of the, the bourgeoisie. And I, I'm just curious as to, as to whether or not um, you're a Mencken fan or whether he had any sort of influence on you. Uh, I'm a huge Mencken fan. He's someone who I came to a little bit late. Um, I, I, I really didn't get into him until I was uh, in my mid-20s. Um, I, I, um, I'd seen some of the stuff earlier, but there was some of his political stuff is a little bit bombastic, um, and it seemed like it uses the same phrases over and over. And that was what I was first exposed to. But then, um, at, at some point, when I was 25 or 26, I bought a copy of his uh, Crestomathy, which I'm probably mispronouncing. It was his collection of his best writings, and I was stunned to see his grace and his fluency with ideas and with history. And um, he was an absolute master of epigrams, and he could spear a subject or spear a politician. Uh, it was almost like someone being hit with a javelin thrown 100 feet away. Uh, some of the stuff he did on uh, President Wilson, on William Jennings Bryan, on some of the other rascals of that period, it was just magnificent. And he was, I was very impressed by his stalwart opposition against Franklin Roosevelt. Um, he, he started out as a Roosevelt supporter, but he quickly became one of Roosevelt's most outspoken critics. And on almost uh, certainly as far as domestic policy, he was spot on. So, But uh, Mencken had a big influence. It was part of what I liked about Mencken was uh, he was able to convey a joy of ideas when he wrote about uh, government politics and, and um, public policy, because so much of, of, of the political writing, it's obvious that the journalists or the professors or whatever uh, don't have a passion for ideas. And that's part of why so much of it's so flat and kind of uh, doesn't have any lasting value. Whereas H.L. Mencken could find ways to uh, take some, uh, you know, some event, some temperance rally or whatever, and, and to find the the lines were like there was a lasting lesson from that, uh, you know, fiasco or from prohibition. 
Jim, your own writing career has kind of straddled the the pre-internet age and now the internet age and and this social media age. I, you know, I think if if Mencken were alive today, he would say that technology has not saved us. That maybe social media is making us stupid. Um, I, I'd like your perspective on on you know your writing career and and the American public before everything was available instantly digitally, and then today where it seems like we've got so much education, so much information available to us, but we seem less intelligent than ever. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting to see how people's reading habits have changed. And uh, my impression, they have not changed for the better, that people have got a much shorter attention span now uh, that, um, that um, uh, from what I've read and heard, folks tend to read articles differently. Folks tend to skim an article instead of actually reading it. And that's frustrating to me because I always try to craft an article so that at least the first paragraph or the first few paragraphs is going to be smooth and clear and have some ideas and hopefully raise some principle. Uh, but if folks are just kind of skimming, uh, that doesn't doesn't uh, hold people. And also, um, I, I think that folks tend to look at things um, that, that, that that if folks are just glancing at articles, that they're almost looking for the for the article that screams the loudest. And uh, and usually that's not uh, not the most substantive article. Uh, flip side is um, uh, back prior to the internet age, uh, there were a lot of gatekeepers that kept a lot of hard line ideas or a lot of facts about government abuses, kept them from reaching a broader public. So that if people are curious now to learn about the Federal Reserve or to, or to learn about some of the abuses of the ATF or the FBI, a, quick, a few Google searches, and, uh, and they can pull up uh, a lot of hard information that's far more easy to access than what they could have gotten 20 years ago. In your view, do you think an individual can truly be educated if they're not reading books? Can can just reading articles, being active online, is that enough to be informed and educated today? Well, you know, those are two different questions. The question of being informed, I mean, yes, a person can get a lot of information if they go to the, some good, credible websites. Unfortunately, there's a lot of websites out there that uh, kind of miss their rabies shots and spend a lot of time barking at the moon. As far as whether a person is educated, that's a different standard because uh, it's very important to be able to have the oh uh, to have a mental or uh, uh, to have a philosophical or even implicit philosophical framework in which you're able to process information which comes to you. Um, one thing that had a big influence on me when I was, um, I guess, coming of age. Uh, I started out in college at Virginia Tech. I dropped out and I later came back for about a year, a year and a half. Uh, but uh, uh, a neighbor had given me a, a book list from the University of Chicago. Their, their great book list, which was very fashionable in the 1950s and, 1950s and then not so much afterwards. But that was a guide to a lot of the classics of Western thought, political thought, philosophical thought, historians, uh, some theology, which never fetched me, but... Um, and I, I was captivated by that and read a lot of those um, books on that list. And um, that probably had more influence than anything else in kind of waking up my dormant mind, because prior to that, I'd been interested in, um, well, let's just say that my interests were quite narrow. And, I, and, and you know, I, uh, having spent uh, 12 years in government schools, it, it was the most brain numbing experience of my life. And uh, I from that, I, uh, I I lost my natural love of reading, which came back very quickly after I graduated high school. But it was reading some of those classics, which which gave me uh, a, a paradigm and helped me appreciate uh, some of the uh, other uh, later writers like Mencken or uh, Hayek or some others. Uh, so, 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 how is that for a long ramble? Well, the question is, do you still have the list? Uh, I still have the list, indeed. I, I still have the list, and I was actually looking at it a few years ago because I'd gone through and annotated it as far as uh, the uh, books I'd read and what I thought of them. And uh, there were so many books that really snapped my head back and opened my eyes, um, especially a number of the philosophers who were quite skeptical of, uh, well, of government, of politics, and sometimes of humanity, per se. Uh, and it was such a different view than what I'd been exposed to, because there was um, not much intellectual stimulation uh, where I grew up. So let me ask you this: Your books, your articles, are known for their uncompromising, no holds barred delivery. Do you feel like there was ever a point in your career where, if you you just sort of softened around the edges, if you'd just been a little bit more willing to write something that perhaps one party or the other 
uh, you know, would, would favor that this would have helped you on a personal, professional, or, you know, financial level? Oh, that's a difficult question. Uh, hell yes. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's plenty of times, uh, plenty of times that I could have, uh, cashed in by selling out. But if I was going to sell out, then what's the point? I, I might as well become a damn lobbyist. Uh, so no, I mean, there was, you know, I mean, I, there were, there were certain periods, I mean, like after nine 11 that there was, well, I mean, um, after nine 11, I was saying some of the th- same things, which I'd said before. And, uh, a point I was trying to drive home was that nothing happened on nine 11 that made the federal government more trustworthy than it was before nine 11. And yet there was this, this mass adulation of government. And that was one of the things that was impressed me most about Ron Paul is he was one congressman who stood against that uh, fervor and, and spoke out against the Patriot Act and spoke out against the new money, money laundering rules and spoke out against the war in Iraq. Uh, and, and not only was he right, he was eloquent, he was on point and he was credible. And it was um, it was such a novelty. Uh, I mean, um, it almost made me doubt my conclusions about politicians. Almost, almost. We'll have a we'll have a qualifier there, Jim. I'll leave you with this. Uh, you're a guy who is known for uh, enjoying a cigar now and then. So my question for you is 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 my final question for you is concerns the nanny state. We're we're at a point now where with the Obamacare law we've given folks on one side, the ability to say, well, aha, your decision to wear a motorcycle helmet, to smoke cigarettes, to eat uh, pizza and ice cream all day doesn't just affect you. It affects all of us because, gosh, we're all in this together. We all pay. Um, where do you think this ends? Is there ever an end to the insatiable desire of the nanny staters? Um, it seems as if the only logical end is to put everybody in jail uh, because that's what uh, that's the direction it's trending in. And there's so much intolerance by a lot of these so-called paternalists and it's uh, um, it's it's not simply it's not simply a question to be concerned about health. For instance, on the cigar smoking, I think a number of the policies are driven by intense animosity towards the uh, cigar smokers, and to a lesser degree, a lesser degree against cigarette smokers. And there's other habits as well. So, but it's this. Uh, there was a wonderful line from H. L. Mencken. He said something to the effect that in most cases. Uh, folks, uh, uh, folks who want to who claim that claim that they want to help humanity actually want to control it, and I think that's what we're seeing with Obamacare and a lot of the other policies. And uh, going back to the attention deficit democracy theme, I hope that at some point enough Americans will wake up that we can pull in the leash on this um, on government out of control. But uh, I'm not holding my breath, and I'm stocking up on cigars. Ladies and gentlemen, before there was Glenn Greenwald, there was Jim Bovard. Check him out at jimbovar.com. And Jim, we deeply appreciate your time this weekend. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. I really enjoyed it.